My name is Neil Postman, and I'm the chair of the Department of Culture and Communication here at NYU. And I, I like to think there would have been no Department of Culture and Communication at NYU, at least not in the form it's taken if it weren't for Marshall McLuhan. I met him in uh, the mid-1950s. I was a graduate student at Columbia, and uh, one of my professors, Lou Forsdale, who was a great friend of McLuhan's, used to bring McLuhan down from Toronto to give lectures at Columbia. And in those days, uh, McLuhan was an obscure English professor, and no one knew anything about him, really. But uh, Forsdale uh, thought that uh, McLuhan was uh, to be the wave of the future. That's why he brought him down. And he would come to Columbia and give these uh, wonderful talks that most students did not like very much and other professors did not like very much. One of the reasons the professors didn't like uh, his talks is that McLuhan never seemed to answer any of their questions. If someone asked him a question about some idea he had, he would typically say, well, look, if you don't like that idea, how about this one? And this was not the professor's thought uh, the way academics were supposed to behave. But some of the students liked him. And my best friend, Charles Weingartner, and I, we always sat right next to each other. We fell in love with uh, McLuhan and attached ourselves to him and his ideas. So that's where my life with Marshall McLuhan began. I think it would have been 1974 or five. There were several reasons uh, he uh, was so attractive to us. One of them was that he took popular culture very seriously and could connect popular culture to what you might call classical culture. He was the only person I think I'd ever known up to that time who could in one sentence talk about the Hollywood Westerns Plato and Socrates and then still in the same sentence go on to something about popular music or Elvis Presley or someone of that sort and he would connect it and uh, try to show how one thing was related to the other and no one had ever talked that way before as far as I knew. So that was one thing. But I also liked his, very much his style of speaking. I mean, he, he loved to make puns and he, uh, he had a, a good sense of humor, although sometimes people didn't know he was making a joke, but somehow I caught on to that. And also, perhaps most of all, was a certain sense that I and some other students had, that this guy was had a point of view about culture and about media that no one else that we could find had. I learned later there were people who had a similar point of view. Lewis Mumford, for example, who had this point of view much earlier than McLuhan. McLuhan, by the way, acknowledged that. But I didn't know much about Lewis Mumford then or, or anyone else. And so I think it was a combination of what I perceived to be the uniqueness of McLuhan's point of view and his non-academic style, which in the end, of course, made him very popular with young people when, when he became world famous because he was, he was not pompous. He talked about things that young people knew about and he had a gift for metaphor and a gift for punning so I think for all of those reasons I, I was drawn to him as so many others were I think what turned some students off and almost all of the professors is that uh, McLuhan was probing you know, he always used that term these are probes Although he could say things in a very definitive way, 
you could sense that this was an exploration on his part, that he really didn't know the answer here, but he, what he was contributing was a way of thinking about these matters. And I know we probably will get to his legacy, but if I may say it now, what McLuhan mainly contributed was a question rather than an answer which you know a lot of students don't like if you just give them questions and uh, his question was what is the relationship of the forms of media to the way we respond to them not so much the content but the form and while others asked that question before I mean if we want to go back to uh, Plato find people who have who have been on to that but McLuhan raised it when he did at the right time because this was a time when media was taking charge of American cultural life and no one was raising that question in in a way that could interest other people when I say media was taking charge in a way that's that is an oversimplification you're you're quite right pre the pre McLuhan era people had media the newspapers I would say uh, uh, were the dominant public medium although I did grow up with radio television of course which begins to be prominent in the 50s is you know a, a massive it causes a massive change in American culture. And at that time, teachers, for example, were not paying much attention to television. They, they liked to call it the boob tube. And their only advice they had about it for the children was don't watch too much television. So along comes um, someone like McLuhan who says, well... This is changing everything in the culture, and not just because of the, the content of the programs, but because of the form of it, that it's visual, that you watch it at home. You know, all the things he suddenly called our attention to. Of course, he had some ideas about the form of television that uh, no one has been able to corroborate, but that that was it didn't matter and that's one of the reasons why I liked him and so many students didn't that he would uh, he would say things that he ne didn't necessarily believe but he was testing them out and people actually do that all the time but but uh, they don't usually do that say in a classroom or a lecture hall that they have a kind of idea and they try to give expression to it and then if you say, do you really believe this? And they say, maybe not. <laughs> but how, how do you think about it? Some people resent that, feel that you've put them on. But I, I must say I never felt that way. Uh, maybe I was lucky, but somehow I sensed that this was a form of learning that he was teaching me. And I do remember once, I think someone has written about this because... Uh, at an interview I mentioned it, that Charlie Weingartner and I and McLuhan were together in a hotel room. It was at a conference in Cincinnati, a teacher's conference. And in those days he smoked cigars and it was uh, uh, about three in the morning. We'd been talking all night. Charlie and I were just exhausted and uh, we thought it was time to go to sleep. And uh, McLuhan was, I could... The room was dark because the lights had been turned off. And I could see the glow of the cigar. And he kept talking. And, and he would say, well, what do you think of this idea? You know, that the uh, invention of the railroad led to divorce or some... I, I can't remember exactly what... And he would go on and on with this. And I remember Charlie said to him one point, Marshall, it's it's three thirty in the morning. Give us a break here. But uh, this didn't deter him, and he went. And then suddenly, Kevin, he say one of these connections, 
It was sort of like a little game he would play. What do you think that this thing might have led to this thing? And he'd say something, and you'd sort of jump up and say, yeah, let's think about that, how that could be. So for him, a scholarship was a kind, a, a, a truly a kind of exploration. And he, he was quoted uh, several times as saying, um, you know, he, he didn't really believe what he was saying, but he wanted people to think for themselves about these issues. And that was a good way to do it. What kind of influence did he have on you? I think of my books as a result of my association and study with McLuhan. That I think I could never have written most of them if not for McLuhan. And uh, in, I would say, but 80% of them, I actually refer to McLuhan and, and acknowledge this fact. But I must tell you that McLuhan didn't think so much of my books in that he thought that I was too moralistic, that, uh, that I was, instead of trying to understand media, I was more interested in judging media and what its effects are for good or ill on the culture. So he used to, he used to chide me about that. I once said that I was too rabbinical in my books. Nonetheless, I think he was, uh, if I may say it, proud that I was writing the books and that I acknowledged so easily and uh, gratefully his uh, influence, uh, his influence on, on my work. But, you know, I wrote a, a, an introduction to a, a biography of McLuhan in which I discuss this point and say that McLuhan, I think, was also very, if I may say it, rabbinical in the, in the sense of being very moralistic. That he, uh, he always denied that he was that, and, and it's a good point that he was making because too many of us are so quick to evaluate the effects of media, good or ill, on people and get diverted from trying to understand how it's really working. And, and that's what he tried to do. But I don't think he could disguise, at least not to me, when I, when I talked with him and when I even read his books, that he was moralistic himself. I mean, he was a convert to Catholicism, as uh, you know, and, um, and he didn't take that lightly. Uh, so that uh, he had um, uh, a, uh, a sort of ideology, very carefully hidden at times, and that was the answer I would always give to him when, when he would, uh, uh, you know, chide me about my being uh, too quick to judge the good or bad of media. And, and sometimes if, if he did it a little too much, <laughs> I would say, well, you know, I pick up a kind of uh, moralistic way of thinking in, in your own work. But he, he, he didn't like it when I said that. Were you aware of the criticisms of uh, McLuhan when he was alive, particularly during that uh, sort of celebrity period? Well, I was aware of uh, criticisms made, especially his, uh, shall we say, silence on the Vietnam War. Uh, but, um, I, I mean, I thought of him as such a special kind of contributor to our intellectual life that I was not put off by this. And the thing about McLuhan, which people would not know unless they knew him and, and talked to him, is that he had a kind of tape in his head that he had to play out. He was, I would say, the worst listener I've ever met. But who cared? When you were in his presence, he was playing the tape. And if you were smart, you'd listen. Now, you could ask a question, of course, 
And sometimes he'd ignore it and the tape would just go on. Sometimes the question was pretty good and he would insert another tape, you know, that was a little more responsive to this question. And it would go on for 20 minutes or a half hour. And you'd have to be a pretty dumb guy to interrupt too much because you knew this was a rare opportunity. I mean, how often in life do you get that? To sit and have a cup of coffee with someone and uh, listen to a special kind of brain who's thinking differently from the way other people think. So why would you want to... You know, say anything. Now, of course, what happens sometimes is then when you leave him, your head's filled with all these assertions he's made. Now, then it's up to you to say, no, th this really didn't make any sense. I, I don't know why he said that. This didn't make any sense. But this, I have to think about that. Yeah, the more I think about it, yeah, I see something in that. So, in a way... He was the best teacher one could ever have, provided that you understood the situation you were in and that you were not uh, ready to find error in what he's saying. But let him say what he has to say, and then you, in your own way, in your own time, take this and try to make something out of it. Which, by the way, is exactly what I have done in my career. And sometimes I would say to him, well, you know, I in uh, this Amusing Ourselves to Death book or that I did, or, or uh, well, I, I don't think he lived to see the disappearance of childhood, but I, with some other books I did, where I'd say, Marshall, I'm doing what you want me to do anyway. And if I'm not seeing it the way you see it, I'm still seeing it because of the way you see it. Sometimes that quieted him on, uh, quieted him on that issue. You know. How did he influence the establishment of this particular department? Well, it, it, he influenced it most directly by saying to me one day, when I said to him, well, w what's going on at the University of Toronto? And, and, and you know, do, and, do you have a Department of Communication? I knew they really didn't. And he said, no, no, he said, I'm, I'm too busy. You know, he was going all over the world then. He was world famous. And uh, there was his name was even a word, you know, McLuhan-esque, if people talk. And he said, what you should do at NYU is to start um, a graduate program where these things can be studied. Now, there is some dispute as to where the name of this department came from. We call it media ecology. And the idea is, learned from McLuhan, that natural ecology is the study of the impact of the environment on uh, all kinds of life, even political and social life, as well as uh, technical life. And media ecology was the same thing, only how media and our relationship to media alters our psychic habits and our political ideas and our social uh, existence. So there's some dispute as to where this term media ecology came from. I like to think I thought of it. But I've had some students who said, no, no, you must have got it from McLuhan because in a letter to um, Luce, uh, Luce's wife, uh, what was her name, Claire Booth Luce, uh, which I have someplace, in this letter he does use the term media ecology. He, he says to her that in the future we may have to control the media ecology. So probably the name came from McLuhan as well, but I, I didn't remember stealing it from him. So it was his idea that we start this program here at NYU, and we began it in, um, in 1971. We, and our first group of students were 17 doctoral students. 
and we only had uh, two professors. We had no idea what we were doing. Like McLuhan, we had a point of view and uh, a lot of ideas about how to look at media. And, uh, of course, it had to be organized like an academic program, which, you know, is, was not McLuhan's style. I should say that five or six years after we got underway, McLuhan came here to NYU as um, he got a special award and a lot of money to come and uh, gave uh, speeches. And we still have some place the uh, videos of, of his, uh, uh, you know, his stay here at NYU. He was only here for um, four days, I think. But he very much approved of what we were trying to do. And since uh, 1971, the growth in the study of communication has been enormous uh, throughout the States and Canada as well. And um, uh, we now have over... 700 undergraduates studying media ecology and uh, about 150 MA students and about 40 doctoral students. So with his encouragement, we began the program here. I, I have to add that NYU, just generally throughout the university, had, had always been and, and is now very receptive to the study of communication. Almost every branch of the university has its own department of communication. Now, uh, some of them are not, don't have anything to do with McLuhan. But you know, we have the Tisch uh, Film School and we, we have uh, in arts and science there, they have journalism and media history and all over the place. So our department here at NYU was just one of maybe six or seven different communication departments. But I, now that I think about it, uh, maybe even, e I doubt that there is a department of communication any place uh, in the country, let alone NYU, whose point of view hasn't in some way been influenced by the fact that McLuhan was here. I mean, not here at NYU, but among the, the living and, of course, our department here is greatly influenced by him, although by now we have, uh, we actually have anti-McLuhanists in the department, which is just fine. You know, people who uh, dispute the way he looked at the world. But even in that case, his influence is there. Don't forget, there are many people who would, uh, with a, a very, say, low opinion of McLuhan, e if they know about him at all, who, much more than they realize, who are, in their own work, influenced by what McLuhan had to say. I mean, even if you disagreed with what McLuhan had to say, you have to deal with that point of view. Nonetheless, there's no disputing that for... I don't know when it started, but let's say, okay, let's say in the 90s, McLuhan, the name, and to a considerable extent the work, disappeared from the academic radar screen. So that it wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me that a young professor would be advised not to pay any attention to McLuhan because it wouldn't, you know, help his or her career. But I think, as with all these things, he's coming back. Do you see that? I mean, you know, there are books coming out about him, a couple of biographies, and we have a uh, an organization here called the uh, Media Ecology Association that works pretty hard to make sure students in uh, communication programs in colleges all in the area uh, know something about McLuhan and his contribution and so on. But, you know, this sort of thing happens in uh, academic life uh, a good deal, that someone comes along, uh, influences a, a generation of young scholars, and then after a while that 
is thought to be old hat, and it's not going to help the career of a young person uh, if they stick with it, and so they find, you know, someone new, like some French person probably. <laughs> so, uh, but even that passes. But there's no doubt in my mind that McLuhan's um, uh, influence will endure. It'll have ups and downs, but you it, it, it's almost impossible to go to a communications conference uh, any place in the country and not hear someone say something that they never would have thought of if not for Marshall McLuhan. But they don't know that. And they're citing someone else, sometimes me, and think that that was my idea. But I could tell them, and sometimes do if I get a chance, well, that wasn't my idea. That was Marshall McLuhan's idea. But And then if McLuhan, if his ghost were there and could speak, probably would say, as he had, well, that wasn't my idea either. That was Lewis Mumford's ideas. You know, that's the way it works. But I don't think McLuhan's name will ever fade. I don't think that McLuhan's name or his contribution will ever fade from uh, view in any responsible interpretation of uh, the academic study of communication. What do you think his influence has been on those of us who are not scholars? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of academics who uh, misunderstood McLuhan's point of view and taught some, uh, I thought, ridiculous version of what McLuhan was trying to teach. But there are a lot of uh, non-academic people who read McLuhan and, uh, like academics, have a, you know, a skewed view of what he was talking about. But... I'm eternally grateful to uh, McLuhan for reaching the kind of audience you're talking about. I mean, people who you know are not academics, have no interest in uh, an academic career, but who are interested in media, uh, interested in culture, and turned at some point to uh, McLuhan's work. So I think his influence by and large has been good with the non-academic audience. I don't know if that audience reads, the non-academic reader reads McLuhan now, say, Understanding Media. It'd be interesting to know what the uh, book uh, sales figures are now. I mean, you, uh, I'm sure the, the many... Uh, academic programs, the book is still required, we do here. But among the uh, general reader, I doubt that he's read uh, much. But 20 years ago, you could draw a larger crowd for a lecture on how to improve your backhand in tennis than you could for a lecture on how television was affecting children 20 years ago, maybe even 15. Somewhere along the line, that began to change. The consciousness, awareness of the effects of media became an issue or started to become an issue. And I credit McLuhan to some extent with that. Now, this is sort of thing that's you know, very hard to prove, and but he made the idea of understanding media, brought it into our consciousness, that something is happening, and it's not altogether obvious what's happening. It takes some thinking to figure it out, which is what McClellan was teaching. So that now, I think in, in well, in Canada, of course, even though I don't think he was much beloved figure in Canada. I could be mistaken. But in the States, it, it, it goes back to what I was saying before. People talk about media to parents. I'm not talking about academics. Just in ways they would not have talked about if not for McLuhan. So there has been a giant leap forward in the interest that ordinary people take 
in the effects of media on their social life, their children, their political ideas, and so on. And that, I think, uh, it will continue right into the, you know, throughout this new century, because it's too, it's too obvious. If the Amer average American, say, 21-year-old, will have seen something like 600,000 television commercials, you don't have to be a genius to say, well, that must have had some sort of effect on the way this person thinks about the world. And then everyone says, yeah, it must. How, how do we get at that? Well, one place to say is, well, let's read Understanding Media. Let's see what this guy has to say and if he has some ideas about this. And invariably, when you do that, people, well, they, I've never met anyone who agreed entirely with McClellan, but people will say, yeah, no, the, the, I think what he says here is actually happening. And I could see it and I can give you examples. And they're off. So I think there's been an enormous increase in uh, interest in effects of media. And people don't even remember anymore when there wasn't. As for the effect of TV on McLuhan himself, I, I don't think it was very good. Uh, I think he, uh, he wanted to get his ideas across to many people. So he did appear on television all the time. And um, I think that it cost him in that you have to keep talking, just saying things that will be provocative. I mean, what's the sense of going on television and saying something that is um, thoughtful? <laughs> you know what I mean, perhaps, that, that uh, the best kind of television is dramatic. You want to keep people's attention on the station so they don't turn to, to another station. So I think McLuhan almost became a parody of himself toward the end. And maybe he couldn't even control it. I mean, he was in such demand uh, that he seemed to be uh, every place. And uh, it might have been more than he or anyone else could handle. You can't ever say to a question on television, I have no idea. You know, or, you know, I, I thought I had an answer to that, but lately I'm thinking it's all wrong. Next question. I mean, <laughs> actually that might get an audience's attention. But in any case, I think it, toward the end of his career, he seemed to me to be somewhat less serious, less less thoughtful you know that he, I mean he was always saying provocative things but one always had the sense that he had somehow thought this through and he was testing it but when I saw him on television toward the end it seemed as if he was almost doing a spoof of McLuhanism I mean because he was already an icon and then television itself uh, the way it's uh, conducted, at least in the States, is um, uh, uh, almost encourages you to do a spoof of yourself, especially if it's you know, a three or four or five minute interview. I remember once he called me, he said, well, meet me at the hotel, we'll have lunch. He was in New York to do the Today Show. Well, I, I, I knew he had, he would only be on for like three minutes. You know, I know the format of the Today Show. Maybe it's four minutes. Yeah, he he wasn't going to be on and actually have an opportunity to to explore an idea. You know that that wasn't in the cards. So I suppose if you do a lot of that, I mean to anyone, I think it would happen. You begin to stop thinking and just say what comes to your mind, or the more. Um, sensational or uh, even absurd the better because you know if people sort of thought of McLuhan as being somewhat cryptic and uh, I do remember once when he was here as our uh, guest at NYU I was his host 
and we had dinner at the president's house, I mean, President of NYU's house, and he had a lot of important entrepreneurs there, the CEOs of the biggest companies for this dinner. And I was sitting next to Marshall, and people were eating their dessert when the president knocked on a glass, and I think Marshall was almost like this with the ice cream or something, and the president said, well, uh, I'd like to uh, ask our guest, Professor McLuhan, to uh, say some things that we'd be interested in. Now, they were all entrepreneurs, so there were no academics there. And I could see McLuhan was very annoyed that right in, almost in the middle, well, in the middle of his having dessert, he has to stop and say something. Well, it was about oh, a day in uh, November, like like it is now, but it was about 6 o'clock. It was a little dark outside, and we could see into Washington Square Park, which was all lit up, and uh, McLuhan asked everyone to turn around. We were in a penthouse, but look out at the park at all the lights, and he said, Scheherazade. And then he goes back, and I could see some of these guys saying, Scheherazade, what the hell does this mean? You know, and but some of them thinking, well, it mu who is Scheherazade? What is it? It must mean something <laughs> for business in America. Well, he was just you know, pulling their legs, and he was irritated. And but I could see someone uh, in his spot, given where he. The, the, his iconographic status in the culture, being asked all the time to say something profound, to say something interesting, to, program after program, venue after venue. And then after a while, it, maybe it just becomes almost a silly game because you can make money from it, which I'm sure he did. But I never really held that against him, Kevin, in part because I knew that if I had been in that situation, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. So, and I was quite content by then that his contribution to me personally and to the field was so great that this stuff in the end uh, would be forgotten.